Yeah. Now, okay. So, if you could uh, start off with an introduction, just one more time for the online. Sure. Viewers. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Paul Albert, a graduate student here at George Mason University, and um, I was invited here to showcase Tableau, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. And um, the idea is, uh, I'd like to set the context first around the problem Tableau is trying to solve give you a hands-on demonstration of Tableau. If you're interested, show you where there's some resources for further learning about data visualization as well as using Tableau. Um, show some examples of Tableau in use in different applications that might resonate with this group. Mm -hmm. And then selfishly, um, show you a little bit of my work and see if you all have any suggestions on, on how to improve what I'm doing. So. Uh, the Tableau, and, and forgive me if this sounds a little salesy, because I, I was a Tableau salesperson. This is my first Tableau presentation since leaving Tableau sales. But you would be happy to know that academic licenses are free for Tableau. So all you need to do is go to academic tableau.academic, tableau.com academic, and you would be able to register for a free license. Um, this is a Tableau mission statement to help people see and understand their data. And what this means is to help interpret data and to, through visualization. This might be a little bit different from what you all are doing in the sense that you're trying to model outcomes. You know, Tableau was never meant to be a modeling program. Um, I'd be very interested if you all had That's ideas. That's why I told them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you are? A data science sure sure strategy. yeah so it, w it was never intended to be a modeling program but um, as we'll see in some of the examples people have used tableau in a variety of different ways so um, how it can be used by in, in your specific work I'm, I'm happy to discuss and hopefully uh, generate some ideas so this is the problem that tableau <laughs> saw is uh, Human, not, human data is far outpacing our ability to understand it. 99% of the data that's ever been created was created in the last three years. Three years from now, that's going to be true. 99% of the data will be created three years from now. And it's particularly challenging to, um, to try to make sense of things. Our understanding hasn't kept up with the data. Uh, Peter Burke, a social historian, says that when we went with the printing press and the dissemination of knowledge, we went from the age of wisdom to the age of knowledge. You know, perhaps we're starting to enter into something that would be the age of analytics and, and understanding. Um, how I would distinguish Tableau from other types of technology that you all might be using 
is usability. So this was built not for a data scientist as much as for somebody who is not a data scientist with a capital D and a capital S. You know, a data scientist with a small D and a small S. Somebody who's trying to accomplish a specific goal. Junior data scientist. You know, it might be someone with the name analyst. It, you know, it's it's not it it's not an academic data scientist that this was designed for. You know, and consequently, it's a billion dollar company. You know, and consequently, um, it's the number two most sought after skill on LinkedIn. If you go to Indeed.com, you'll see that it's had 1,400% growth in job uh, postings that are listing Tableau as a skill. So even if it might not help you directly in some of your academic research, um, I think it's a skill that's worth thinking of introducing to your students as you go forward. But the point of this slide is that there's not a nonlinear relationship between the use of a software and the usability of the software. That the more usable that you make something, the higher the use, and arguably the higher the usefulness. So uh, let me uh, show you Tableau, and because we're on a VGA screen, it's not going to be ideal in terms of being able to visualize everything. Um, let me see if I can do something here with my display settings. Let me try it a different way. Okay. So this is uh, the Tableau desktop. This is what you would see once you open Tableau. On the right are various links to how to learn Tableau and to perform better with it. Then we have some resources that you all might be interested in. Specifically, this resource is being highlighted because I'm signing in with a free academic license. So it's showing me, okay, here's how to teach data analytics in an academic school. On the left are ways that we can connect with data. So, um, you know, most of our users use Excel when they're just starting using Tableau, but as you get more advanced, people have other demands. Uh, what sort of data sources are you all using? Sources? Well, m most of them, I guess. Databases? Or well, they're text files. Yeah, okay. Normally so that's the output from a simulation. Okay. So, uh, in addition to Excel, Tableau is able to read text files. It's able to connect to statistical files, so you can connect directly with our data if you, if you need to. Um, it's able to connect with some pretty hefty data, data sources, such as Amazon Redshift, uh, Google uh, BigQuery, Google Analytics, uh, Postgres. So pretty much anywhere you're storing your data, Tableau will be able to connect directly to. In this case, what I want to do is connect to a data source that I have stored locally, and it's uh, domestic <coughs> flights, flights inside the United States. So let me try challenging myself. Oftentimes, what I like to do is do sort of like a demo improv, where I try to make the data a little bit more relevant to the group. Mm -hmm. uh, can someone give me an example of some of the research that they're doing? Well, first, I need to model a population of 20 to 25 million people responding to a nuclear WMD event in New York City. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> you want to go scale down from that? <laughs> and I think it, it may be helpful just to kind of give you a background of what we do here in the department. Sure. Would that be helpful? I, 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 so we, we, most of us here work on model, uh, models that take simulation into account. Right. So uh, I was just explaining it to some pr prospective students. So typically we may have a data set and we try to create uh, a simulation that will uh, reproduce the properties of that, of that data set. So it's, right. it's simulation products a lot more than data products. Exactly. Um, what's where, where something like Tableau will come in is in the 
pre-analysis phase where we're trying to get a, a sense of what the data is saying, or in the post-analysis or the post-simulation phase where we're, we're taking our, uh, the, the synthetic data that is reproduced by our model and perhaps comparing it to the real world data that we collect. Right. Right. So, but but the focus of the department in general is is, is simulation and, uh, and we've is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I thought as much, but it's thank you so much for um, for sharing that. Let's uh, let's stick with this data. Is to, um, you know rather than no, this is showing flight data within the domestic United States, I, I would be tempted to change number of flights to number of people destination into bureau, borough of New York City or, or something like this. But let's yeah. let's take a look at this. So uh, what you see here is a Tableau desktop. Um, on the left, we see dimensions. These are ways that we would categorize our data. They're qualitative. On the bottom, we see measures. These are ways that we would quantify our data. Mm -hmm. Columns and row shells, this is how we're going to drive our visualization. And then a marks card, which is going to add some detail to the visualization. So let's get started. And if I just click on, double click on Origin Airport, what Tableau is going to do is recognize the airport codes. And it knows that that's a geographic property and will put them on a map for us. Uh, there's a lot of different map features that if you're interested, we can discuss as, as we go along, but this, let's just start with a general overview. Um, since we know where our airports is, let's add some richness to the data. And I'm going to take my number of flights, I'm going to take my number of flights, and I'm going to put it on my size card. And what do y'all think it's going to do? Size the circles by the number of flights. Now, likewise, what I can do is take my departure delay and put it on the color. And then we're going to get a different color for every airport based on the departure delay. And because we have a lot of airports that are on top of each other, I'm going to jigger it just a little bit by adding borders to, to make things pop a little bit more easily. So now we have a map. Uh, Tableau offers something called tooltips which means when you highlight a specific mark on a visualization, it's going to tell you more about that mark. In this case, we're at the Denver airport and their departure delay was 11.65, number of flights is 1.1 million. I'm going to call this sheet um, airports by flights and delays. And when I hit enter, you'll notice that it populates that to the title. So the default is the tab name becomes the title name. Um, as a next analysis, what we can do is just double click on our number of uh, flights. And in this case, you see we have 26.7 million. So the way my data set is arranged is each row is a record, um, each flight is a record. So this data set has 27 million records in it. Uh, I've gone up to a billion records on this machine, and it's it's not speedy, but it it, it goes pretty pretty quickly. Um, based on what I heard in the beginning, I would hazard to guess that nobody's actually using Excel to analyze data here. They do some well, piloting, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We use it a lot for debugging. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to say friends don't let friends use Excel for analysis and, and hopefully by the end of the talk you, you, you might agree so in this case what we're going to do is take departure date move it up to columns and then rather than just a single bar showing the departure we're going to see a, a line chart and I can expand my years by clicking on this um, plus sign here, and it'll take me out to years and quarters. And clicking one more time will take me to years, quarters, and months. So uh, we don't need quarter for this analysis, so I'm just going to drag it out of the view. And here what we're seeing is the flights by month across a number of years. 
we can do a little bit what we did before where I'm going to take um, the departure delay, drag it to size, and what do you all think is going to happen? We're going to size the lines based upon the departure delay, and then to reinforce that measure, or reinforce that idea, why don't we take it out to color as well? So now what we're seeing is across the years, uh, let me say fit to width. Now we're seeing across the years, you know, the delays and uh, number of flights by year. So now the position on the y-axis is number of flights and the thickness is number of delays? Or yes. Percentage of delays? Uh, the size of the average delay. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you don't, you, you don't want too many dimensions to confuse people. You know, so I could, if I had another, another measure, not to, but like a rival de delay, you know, you, you don't want to have your size and your color in the position be all different measures because it's so easy to be confused. So in general, more, two measures is, is what you want in, in order to, to show this sort of thing. You can see enough to see that it's strikingly seasonal. It's strikingly seasonal. And you can see enough that here we see that it was disproportionately seasonal mm -hmm. in, in 2012. Um, if we wanted to see this based on seasonality, what I could do is just take year, drag it off the shelf, and drag it onto detail. And now we have a line for every year. And we're able to, to see it that way. Pretty good association. And if I wanted to, I could just drag the year onto my label mark, and then we would have each year marked for, for what the labels were. Uh, Tableau offers unlimited undos. So let's go ahead and undo what we just did. Um, one of the interesting things about Tableau is its visual nature. So what's driving this is um, some real geniuses who were founders. Chris Stolte out of uh, Stanford and his advisor, Pat Hanrahan. Um, Pat was, came out of Xerox Park to co-found uh, Pixar movies mm -hmm. and then went to Stanford to teach. He has uh, three uh, Emmys on his desk. <laughs> the only company I've worked for where the CTO had Emmys. So what, what's really remarkable about this is something Tableau calls visual query language, which means rather than using menus to drive what the view is, rather than using a command language to drive what the view is, you're physically manipulating these little pills and you're putting them on the visualization in order to show exactly what it is. So somebody who's used Tableau for a while can look at the arrangement of those pills and the pills on the mark card and be able to say, I know exactly what this worksheet is doing. That's a little bit different than most other visualization software. The other remarkable thing about Tableau, and this is on the back end, is you could be connected to multiple data sources. I could have an Amazon Redshift database, I could have a SAP HANA database, and what Tableau will do is optimize the query going back into the database based upon what database it's connecting to. So the VizQL, this is the front end, and then database optimization is the back end. So uh, let's play with this a little bit. I can take my year. Yes, sir. Does Tableau come with an API? So can I run these functions through like Python or something? Uh, we have calculations. Uh, see, I'm saying wait. Tableau has calculations um, where you're able to call out to Python. You're also able to use a calculation to call out to R. We have JSON integration where you're able to connect to a web API. Um, and there's various other ways that, that, that you could do it. I haven't done it personally, but I'd be happy to work with you. But that's the direction? What? So that, that's going out. Can I call from? Yes. So I can call from Python some a Tableau function? I'm not sure. Yes, you can. I did it before. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so back to this idea of visual SQL. Uh, I have year, where I have a pane for every year, and then I have month, where I have a point for every month. Hopefully you're not tired of me asking questions, but what do you all think would happen 
if I take year and I move it to the right of month. Rather than a pain for every year, we're going to get a pain for every month. You know, so this would en enable us to do a month-to-month -month comparison much, much more easily. So the heart of Tableau is this idea of being able to visually represent what your data should look like. Um, a lot of people that are using Tableau used to use Excel, and one of the things that people like about Excel is the physicality of it. You know, I'm into this cell and I'm pointing at that cell and I'm, I'm physically getting my hands on the data. <coughs> Tableau carries this paradigm one step further by allowing you to physically get your hands on how the data is described in driving the visualization. Now, where did year go in this It's right down display. here. It's, uh, but what's happening in, in each of these panes Right, so if that, we hover that over... That book line there represents year to year. So it's, the pain is the month, yeah, and the points are the year. So as you, you see, we can come here, here's 2011. Yeah, 2000. within each of those panes, that book curve is year to year. Yes, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. So it's still there. But let's, let's, uh, let's just shift this back. Um... <clears throat> There's a concept called small visualizations, uh, a way to help you not only visualize one, one set of data, but visualize it across a, a whole set of data. So for example, if we were to drop uh, the origin TSA region, I sold to DHS, so this was, this was built for DHS onto my shelf. What we see is we're able to build a small visualization that's gonna okay. show us year to year seasonal comparisons across all the TSA regions. Now I could equally do this based on airport, I could do it on state, uh, it's just that there's seven TSA regions so it, it makes a little bit better of a view. So I'm going to call this flights and delays by year. Now, one of the things Tableau offers that people really don't give enough attention to is a, a unique way to analyze data. So what I did is I dropped my carrier name to my rows and it went through all 27 million records and it said, okay, here are your unique carriers and listed them for me. Uh, next thing I can do is say, let's take a look at the number of flights. Again, went through all 27 million records, sum them all, and then let's break that out by the TSA region that the flights originated in. And this is a common way that you're going to see data represented is as a text table. Uh, I'm going to add uh, totals to my rows and totals to my columns so that you can see what I'm going to be doing next. And we call these table calculations. So these are ways to use Tableau to better manipulate and understand your data. If I right click on my pill, you see what Tableau is telling me is your rows are carrier names, your columns are TSA regions, and T, this stands for the text, is the sum of the number of flights. So we can look at it right here and say this is exactly what we're saying. What we're saying. But if I right click and I say add a table calculation, it gives multiple different ways of understanding our data. So you see here the calculation type is the difference from and we're looking at table across. We could do it table down if we want it, and then there's a number of different ways of partitioning this calculation. There's a number of different, uh, different, different types of uh, table calculations, uh, percent difference from. Ranking is really interesting when you're comparing l large cohorts with each other. In my case, what I'm going to do is look at the percent of total. So as you see by the yellow line, 
we're looking at the percent of total going across. So that's saying for Alaska Air, 2% of their flights were in Region 1 um, across all their other regions. But maybe what we want to do is look at the market share of the different airlines. In that case, what I want to do is just do the calculation based on table down. Makes sense so far. Um, and there's ways of taking table calculations based on table calculations if you want to get a little bit more complex in how you slice and dice the data. Uh, what I wanted to show next was something called show me. So there's lots of different ways that you can visualize data. And by clicking on this show me tab on the upper right, Tableau says here's different ways we can show that. Uh, we could show it by pie charts, we could show it by stack bar charts, we could show it by, Tableau calls this a tree map, I've heard it called a heat map, uh, I've heard it called a couple of different things, but we could show it uh, in this fashion to show parts to whole. We call this a packed bubble chart. I've yet to see a reasonable use of the packed bubble <laughs> chart. <laughs> um, like, a, like many network diagrams, I would, I would use it as sort of like an amuse bouche. You know, you, we've asked you to think a lot. Here's a pretty picture. Now let's think again. You know, it's sort of like an interstitial thing. I wouldn't put hard data into it. But it, it's kind of unique that Tableau offers it. Um, uh, bar and whisker charts, a uh, very common way that, that people would want to show multiple datas, mu multiple data points. Uh, what's interesting about Tableau is it allows you to go from aggregate views, where we're taking the totals, to disaggregated views where we're seeing the parts and how the parts contribute to the total. And in this case, what we want to do is um, take this, take the fact that we're doing a horizontal bar chart, and I'm just going to play with it a little bit because what I want is TSA region up here, and then the flights going across. And just as we did before, what we can do is take our departure delay, drop it to color, so when you're looking at visualizing any, any set of data, there's a number of things that people will look at as, as, most, as important. The number one factor of importance that people are going to look to is the position of your data point. So in this case, we have our carriers ranked alphabetically, which is perhaps not the most useful way to rank them. Uh, so I can go to carrier name, say let's sort this, and it's going to allow me to sort it by any field. And in this case, what I want to do is sort it by the number of flights. So let's look at the top carriers. And it's going to aggregate it across the entire, um, across the entire data set. So it's not saying, show me the number one for region one at the top. You know, it's showing, based on total, what carrier had the most traffic, Southwest in this case. And we're going to call this uh, market share and delays by region. I, I suppose, like, uh, the, the relevance of Tableau here for, for this course is, it, it's interesting because if we're going to write a journal article, and mm -hmm. this is probably the greatest weakness of Tableau, I if you're writing, writing a journal article or even a paper, this isn't the format <laughs> the journal will want, right? So they'll want, uh, you know, mainly out of R or out of Python, a very specific format. Uh, you know, it's great for present end of class presentations, but even then it's not ideal because, like, you can present like that, but most people obviously transfer to PowerPoint or a PDFs. I hear you. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I suppose, it, you know, I've had a bit of use of it and it's handy, but ultimately you end up having to recreate your Tableau chart in R 
Mm-hmm. Because that's what you need to submit to a journal. Like you can't submit. You know. So you need to send the R code directly to the journal. No, no, no. You just need like the format. You know, it needs to be pretty much black and you know, like most journals are black and white or grey. Uh, you know. Right. So you can't use the colours. Uh, and, and also, I suppose ju some journals are. You know, there's a common types of charts which you use, like as you mentioned, like the the box and whisker. So uh, you know, because otherwise you have to spend a large amount of time in your article explaining what this chart is. Whereas you, you know, you don't right. have to explain that for a box and well, you know, there, a box there, box. there are two issues. One is what will our readers readily understand, and the other mm -hmm. is what will our production software readily handle. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, so the second can be. Solved by JPEGs. Yeah, yeah but, but even then, like they're very specific about the density of it. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Now, I really like where you're going with that, and I'm planning to talk a little bit on, on the subject uh, right. t towards the end. But ultimately, the question I would ask you to ask yourself is can I do more analysis faster? Oh, there's no doubt. Using yeah. Tableau, and maybe I need to go to R, or I could help you figure out how to go black and white with Tableau or do JPEGs. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd be more than happy to help you do that. Yeah. But how many questions can you ask yourself? How quickly can you answer them? And how many new questions can you pose? Oh, yeah, I've should, got no should doubt. be the ultimate test of, yeah. of where what you <coughs> use. Um, for students, I would say this is. This is something that's going to look really good on a resume. But, but, but to go along with, with what right. Matt is saying, just kind of a larger perspective, he's right about the fact that if you're looking for publication quality, um, not just visualization, but analysis, like you say this is, you, you use, I think, um, you've used the word that you've used Tableau as an analysis tool. Mm -hmm. We could never do that. Now, it could be a great exploratory tool, uh, mm -hmm. something that we used to play around with our data before or to play around with it afterwards, but for us to use this as, a, as an analysis tool would be very difficult because as we go into an analysis project, we will typically have very concrete questions and then very um, concrete um, mm -hmm. uh, justification, not justification, very concrete guidelines for how to answer those questions so that we can sometimes achieve statistical significance. So if I ask this question right here and change my data to look a little bit different, differently. <clears throat> I have to justify why is it that I can even ask that question to begin with in a lot of circumstances. Like, why is this even a reasonable question? Can my data even answer that question for me? Yeah, and it's uh, for, for publication. For publication. Yeah, for publication. For publication. And, and exploratory the, methods, though, can be wonderful at helping you figure out which questions to ask. Yeah, and that's what I just said. So exploratory, yeah. I could do whatever I want. Yeah. There's no, but but I can't. But I can't sell that to a publication unless I provide them with maybe some statistics or some kind of justification for why. Right. Uh, yeah. We, we have reason to believe that the delays are seasonal. But, but wait, we there's even more that. reasons we're going to break this model, publication uh, paradigm. But, but, but even going back to Joe's point, so if you bring back up that, uh, look, this is a, a practical example. So if you go back to the geographic map, right? Uh, right. So suppress so on that. Now, th this was a relevant question uh, in a presentation last night, but a bit different. And also to Bill's point, you go, well, I want to map the degree distribution, which you've sort of done, of the number of flights going to each airport, right? So you can see there that Denver's got a lot of flights going in. Now, you might want to draw the lines out from those nodes, uh, but, but that's your question, and then you go, well, you know, You've got to ask the question: Why are some nodes have more flights than others? What are the you, know, you, you would be trying to you would go into the research question going, I'm going to explain why the the hubs of the U.S. air market are in these positions, right? Potentially, or potentially it could be seasonal variations on flight delays. Potentially, well, it could but, be but weather us, impact on flight. Yeah, you know, for this course, the question would be why. Explain why the network formed the way it did. Okay. Fair, fair so, enough. So, so you would go in and go, well, you know, you know, you might want to do like the average distance of the time of each flight or something like that. 
But you can't just draw the map and go, oh, look, we've got a few hubs. You know, yeah, the yeah. question is, we've got the hubs, explain why the hubs are there and how right. the hubs evolve. And, and you know, we're, what we're doing is we're skimming on the surface of Tableau. Uh, there's a number of things that it would allow, such as K-factor clustering, where you can statistically look at where you're placing hubs. Well, that, that's the sort see. of stuff that would be more interesting. It's there. F yeah. It, it, it's so that, that would be more interesting, I think, for this group to see that than, uh, you know, w what is basically just, right. you know, data Descriptive. Mining. I mean, descriptive this is a descriptive model. Mining. This is giving you a very, very yeah. slim feeling of what Tableau is. Yeah. What I'd hope you take away from this is you know, there's a lot of more Tableau than you're seeing, but the point is, is how easy is it for you to ask questions, get answers, and figure out are there more questions to ask the exploratory nature? And then I'm, I'm going to pose another problem to you all when we talk about publication or sharing data. So the last thing I want to show in, in this, and we can certainly open up to questions, is the fact that what we've done is we've created three different visualizations that analyze the data from different perspectives. What we're able to do is create a dashboard where we're able to take these three different perspectives just by dragging them out to the sheet and present them together. Let's give us a little more room here. So right now we have three views that are completely unconnected with each other. Um, but just by going in here and clicking on this filter icon on each one of the views, what we do is we tie them into each other. So now, if I click on Denver, what I get is just the information for Denver. If I click on 2013, I get just the information for 2013. If I click on Southwest, I get just the information yeah. for Southwest. So the point of this is not, I mean, first, this is really, really slick. Yeah. But the second thing is, to the point of asking more questions and getting more answers, now we're able to ask questions about how our different variables and our different ways of analyzing information are tied together. And I would posit to you that this is a more effective way to communicate information of certain types than the standard journal format. Yeah. And, the, and the question is, what does, what does that mean for, can I call myself a scholar? What does that mean for us as scholars? You know, are we going to tailor our message to the medium completely, or to what degree do we want to push the medium to be able to give a richer message? Do you, do, do you want to go along that line? Because I can show you what I'm trying to do with my research, or we well, can I, I go think into... Well, I think that's the main, you know, that, that's for us, it's like, you might have a really great finding, but you need, you know, the idea is to sell that finding with right. as many bells and whistles right. uh, so, as you can. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working on a paper now that looks at, uh, here it comes that looks at a unique data set that was done by a professor, Richard Spear, from University of Maryland, where he took uh, 984 paintings that were sold in Baroque Rome, say, Cento Rome. And he was able to track <coughs> what was the price paid, who was the patron, who was the artist, and a number of other characteristics about the, about the, the, the commission. So, you know, I'm s and the question I want to pose is how much of this information would require reams and reams and reams of writing that would stultify anyone trying to read it versus trying to involve the user, involve the consumer into the information to manipulate it. So in this case, uh, this is just portraying the data set itself. This isn't drawing any conclusions. But we can say, well, show me the years that the commissions happened and be able to look, okay, the average price was 320. Uh, Scooty, Roman Scooty is what we're looking at. Okay. 
In many cases, it was a barter of exchange. So it's like three barrels of wine, two gold chains, a donkey, and five scooty. You know, and, and Professor Spear translated it all into into <laughs> scooty. I mean, it was a Herculean task. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, and so what, we, what we're doing now is we're looking at 1652 to 1708. Uh, we can look at an earlier period and see that the price went to 492. Uh, average price per, per work went from 492. And then allow the user to interrogate the data, to say what, what does the data show and, and how can we work with it? So. What's really important in this period, this is Seicento Rome, is who is the Pope? And what does the Pope say? Some Popes say we can honor God by producing more work of art. Some Popes say works of art are silly, we should be spending our money on, on something else. So Paul V is a Brigese Pope who really liked to buy art. Um, so we can look at this reign of Paul V, we can look at each one of the art the pieces of art. So each one of these dots represents a commission. It could be for a single artwork or it could be multiple artworks. And because we're on the web, we can provide a link where people can click on it and be, you know, go, I'm populating a Google image search to say, show me representative works of this artist. I don't argue that this isn't publication ready, but in terms of communicating information, in terms of really understanding the way that my data is working, mm -hmm. it offers a uniquely powerful way to interpret data. I'm not modeling, mind you, but, yeah. but I am interpreting. Have you done any sensitivity analysis on the assumptions about what Scooty are worth in terms of other commodities? They were remarkably... Um, uh, price uh, inflation resistant during during this period. Uh, there was one seminal work that looks at other currencies, and in fact, Professor Spear uses inflation adjustments yeah. to, to 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 do that. I would guess that some <coughs> commodities move a lot more than the inflation rate, though. It's that's a great point. What's a mule worth to you? That's a great. And it point. depends on what you're doing, doesn't a it? That's a well, great point. Well, could you export a? Um, a Tableau dashboard into uh, an HTML page? Yes. Automatically, and it will do it for me? I don't have to... Um, with, so with the filters that you have there, for example, could that be a web page that I can post online? Yeah, and I'll show you some. See, that's that's pretty cool. You see, that's that's what I'm heading to, cool. is, is posting online. Yeah. So, uh, first thing I wanted to do was take a look at how is the market... how What, what generates an artist's workshop's revenue? You know, a lot of historical research has looked at what chart, what affects the price of any particular painting. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's theories that, okay, you want to look at the work that was involved in it. That could be measured by the number of figures in it. It could be measured by the size of the painting. You want to look at the artist's name. Is the artist someone who's, who's particularly hot? You want to look at who the patron is. Um, so I started out just showing regression analysis, you know, where I'm correlating two different variables against each other. And Tableau being Tableau, we're able to, to highlight a regression line and see what our regression values are. We're able to highlight the specific points and get what the measure is that we're, we're looking at. Um, and I'm pretty stoked. What I found is that the biggest correlation for an artist's revenue was the number of distinct patrons. And that, in fact, was more important than the total number of years the artists work. It was more important than the total number of commissions the artists work. It was more important than the prestige of the patrons the artists worked for. It was more important than the wallet share, the percentage of spending that the artist was able to collect from the patron. So I started with this, and um, I came out of a world where you were building dashboards for people to understand how their organizations were working or to interpret a specific set of data. What I'm beginning to understand is that when you're doing a dashboard to present research findings, it's a completely different animal. You know, so the theory is minimize the verbiage in order to get the user to, to not get between the user and the data. And if you're doing some, you know, there's some pretty complex dashboards out there that users would use every day where you really 
minimize your verbiage to add extra space for, for the dashboard. And this is what I went to. And what I'm doing is I'm adding a lot more verbiage into what I'm presenting. And the ultimate goal is to publish this online where people can interact with the data as well as understand the verbiage. One of the findings that I figured out is that I approach this completely different if I'm trying to write a research paper. You know, if I'm sitting there in front of Word, the qualitative analysis that I'm able to give the data is a lot stronger. You know, this is the period of the Counter-Reformation where the artwork was being changed and artists were being driven to do art in new ways. This was the period where uh, the Vatican, uh, St. Peter's was being finalized, so there was a lot of demand for artists. This is a market where the market entry barriers for artists is much lower compared to other cities. There aren't any dominating guilds. And these are all factors that, that add to the context of the data that I'm struggling for how I can add richness, that richness to it. And I'm thinking maybe go to WordPress, you know, rather than using Tableau as my medium, use WordPress and then bring in the visualizations. And, well, and I, I suppose like, th this is like the interesting thing about journal articles. Like I know I, I made a thing about sure. them, but like, I think on average, it's only like six people read a journal article. Right? Really? It's, yeah, so it, it's not very high, because you think how many journals there are yep. spat out each month, and then it's only <coughs> through word of mouth that the important ones get read. So uh, you, you'll get more viewage through like research gate or posting online and um, like even like I'll say a LinkedIn post with a powerful um, visualization will get more interest than getting buried as chapter six of the but, July right, 2000. Right. I, but there is a difference between the tales now. The yeah. tail for an online post with this type of stuff on it yeah. is, it, it, it goes down pretty quickly. So right. you're gonna get views, you're gonna get 400 views on this and you know, over a period of 12 months and then you're done. Yeah. But a journal article, it may start off having six, if it's high quality, it yeah. will go up to basically every researcher within a domain yeah. in terms of the citations, right? Mm -hmm. right? An online post can only go down, a research article can only go up. Right. So let me just go back to my original question, though. I mean, the question isn't how to get more citations. The question is how to communicate information yeah. more effectively. Mm. And maybe that's not, that that's the question I'm asking myself right now because I don't need citations, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I, I'm not driven by careers. Yeah. But interestingly enough, the dynamics you're describing, the social feedback loop, of journal articles is exactly the social feedback loop that I'm finding in the art market. Right. You know, and I'm positing that art is a social good, unlike a plow where you can measure its effectiveness by how well it's able to turn the earth compared to other plows. Art is meant to signify status and prestige. And playing with the dynamics, understanding those dynamics, and allowing, taking, taking my understanding and then allowing other people to work with that understanding, I think will communicate information more effectively than putting it in print. But I'm finding that there's a need for print as well for other types of information. Um, so this is called a dot and line uh, chart. And, this is all work in progress. So when this is done, you'll be able to sort the different rows by uh, the different factors. So what I'm, this could be a multivariate uh, uh, analysis, correlation analysis. But what I'm trying to do is, because this is a humanities audience I'm writing this for, is to take them along for the ride. So I'm going to start the ride with saying, look at how well an artist did and compare it with a variety of factors. And then I'm going to take them to say, okay, this is what you've done visually. Let's do regression analysis and do it statistically. Um, and this is another feature that uh, something like Tableau or an online presentation offers. So this measure is looking at the part, uh, patron, the painter wallet share. So I'm saying, 
for the dollars that were paid to the artists by specific patrons, what percentage of that is of what everything that the patrons spent? So if I had three patrons that spent a total of 100 and I got 10, my wallet share is 10% of, of those patrons' wallets. Now, it kind of breaks down for a number of reasons. Um, we have some artists that, uh, there, there's a number of artists who only had one patron. There's, there, you know, there's a variety of other things. Um, but, so for my analysis, what I want to do is cut this off at 40%. Now, I can explain that in a paper, you know, because of, to, to, to account for data set skew, I did X, Y, and Z. But giving the user the controls to, to look themselves and see if they want to do it, I think that's really powerful. You know, and the next step behind this visualization is going to be allowing them to filter based on submarkets. So show me private patrons doing private display versus public patrons, institutional patrons doing institutional display. And the goal is, again, to, to involve the people in a different way versus the passive I'm reading a journal article. Um, yeah, I, I won't bore you with any more, but that's, that's sort of giving some examples of what I'm finding as I'm trying to use Tableau to do academic research. It's a technical question. Sure. So Tableau can read from a database. Can it push back? No. Tableau is read only. Read only. Yeah, right. what you can do is um, display the whole data set. For, for any of these points, I can right click and view the data and then I can view the full data. Tableau is very transparent. I could build a view where I had all of my records and say save that to a CSV file. It's a workaround. You know, it's, it's not pushing data back into a database by, by any means. But um, there's often times when I'm manipulating and cleaning data where there'll be round trips where I start in Tableau, clean it, send it into Excel, do something with it, send it back into Tableau. Um, and it's possible, but it's, it's not automatic by any means. Yeah. Does uh, Tableau support multiple screens, by the way? This might be a... Yes. Okay. Um, you mean one visualization across several screens? No, I mean, can I take some of these windows and put them in other screens? I, it's not a, sure. When you do an exploratory data, it's sometimes I want to be able to see the data visualization and then whatever else that I'm working on. Yes, I've seen it happen before. So you could, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've, to be useful. one of my clients had, yeah. this isn't your answer, but it's cool. One of my clients had 60 screens all put together and they called it their wall of knowledge. You know, it was <laughs> Tableau dashboards. Tableau oh. actually allowed you to distribute Tableau so. dashboards or screens. Okay, so yeah, yeah, that's what I'd be looking for. Yeah, sometimes I'll, um, it's very, so I, I might have a calculation in one, one dashboard or one worksheet, I want to move it to another, I'll put it on a separate screen, copy and paste. But I haven't taken separate tabs and put them specifically on, on, on separate screens. Uh, have you ever looked at how you would connect this to an analysis with a different dependent variable? Because with artists, Total revenue is just one criterion. Another criterion would be where did the work end up? Mm -hmm. We don't think of Michelangelo as the most, the highest earning artist in Rome, but he's one of the most prominent because Sistine Chapel, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that he got there is, is a tremendous indication of how he was thought of at the time and, and a, tr a tremendous reward. Right. Chato didn't get paid much for the trans. Francis Fresco, but he did them as a labor of love and, and, and adoration. And, and That's an interesting print, point. And artists who donate work. Uh, yeah. So the scope of this is really to look at the market dynamics, to look at what a painter was commissioned for, the dollars he was commissioned for, and what it was meant to be used for. Yeah. Um, the overall prestige is, is another interesting thing. And uh, what, what you find is that the more prestigious artists in that time turned out to be mostly the mo more prestigious artists in this time. And that could be a social artifact where 
that's recognized. There, there aren't there aren't that many unrecognized artists in Seicento, Rome, that were somehow discovered and, and, and became hot, like you might find in today's art market. But maybe it's a great a, question. Maybe not then. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to go much more recent to find artists who were not well compensated exactly. in their time and are tremendously regarded now. Van Gogh was one of those. Exactly. Guy died poor. Exactly. He was one of the highest. His, his paintings are among the, the highest price in the world now. And it's wonderful. It really is. Because I think what, it, it, it's so interesting looking at the economics of painting because it's so unrelated to the economics of other types of goods. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's, a, it's a singular good. It's a social good, a psychic good, that has a di that's completely different than than any other good I can think of. And who's who's well regarded in his time, and who's well regarded later, even critically, mm -hmm. has been known to shift. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were a lot of people who hated Picasso's work at first. You know, and, and this was a time where art was. S switching from design, I have a wall that needs to be painted, <laughs> to the myth of the artist, and the myth, and and you can you can if I had the data, which I don't, I only have the data for this. Sure, you know I would love to see how the myth of the artist started concentrating the value of paintings based upon the artist's name. So let me show you a couple different uh, tableau examples. Um, you, you can have a lot of fun with this down the road. It is so much fun. It is so much fun. Uh, this is a really wimpy simulation model for you all, but I wanted to show you a simulation model. So, um, and uh, you know what it basically does is it says, okay, as we change the commission for different sales, how will our how will our total payments change? And all it's doing is demonstrating that you can give variables into Tableau, and Tableau can calculate a visualization based on that variable. It, it's not really uh, useful otherwise. Um, this is a, a really nice visualization that's showcasing a number of social factors and. We call this a small visualization. I'm not sure why. A trellis chart. The idea is we have a number of different charts in columns and rows. Does it have to be Tableau public, or can you embed your dashboard in any website you build? So that's a great question. I am on Tableau Public, which is uh, like the YouTube for visualizations. So uh, I'm using, when I was showing you Tableau, I was using a free academic license for Tableau. Tableau also offers a free license called Tableau Public, where you can have a perpetual license to Tableau. The only considerations is it can only read Excel, and then it can only save to Tableau Public. But this is like a YouTube for public uh, for for visualizations. It's had over a billion different views. There's uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of visualizations on Tableau Public. So um, this is a view that's been placed on Tableau Public. In this view, you could click on Share, and here is Embed Code, where we could embed that visualization and put it into another web page. So it does support that, that capability. Uh, so what I like about this is we're able to compare a lot of different countries with each other. Uh, the author of the of the, the biz, that's what we call visualizations biz, uh, was good enough to put a reference line, and this reference line is showing what the average is. So while it's a little hard to compare Guatemala to Bahrain, you can look at least where each country was for for their average. You've got a number of questions, back to your publication statement, for any visualization, you have a number of different questions you need to ask. One is, uh, what do I want to do with this visualization? Do, do I want to communicate information, that, which is what most visualizations are meant to do? Some visualizations are meant to emote. Some visualizations are meant to say, look how sophisticated I am, I deserve more money to do findings, or you know, the, it's, it's a claim of sophistication. You can do that with Tableau. You can do that with a number of different softwares. Um, I don't know 
on the spectrum where I would put this visualization in terms of its ability to communicate information, you would need to be fairly, fairly, um, fairly uh, uh, knowledgeable of the data to, to be able to understand. Um, I saw you looking at your watch. What time would you like this to, to wrap up? 4.30, well, except it's after that now. <laughs> yeah. We need your next 15 minutes? Sure, sure. And again, my, my apologies for starting late. That's okay. Uh, this is um, an interesting... I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is looking at uh, uh, presidential votes by uh, state. Um, and what the author has done is shown how left-leaning and how right-leaning each state is by the angle of the line. Uh, they've shown how, populate, how populated each state is by the width of the point. So here we see California, um, and it starts to become more and more democratic mm -hmm. a, as the elections go on. Uh, you know, is this some? Is this a model? No. Is this a way of showing complex information fairly quickly and intuitively? I think so. Uh, one last example. Uh, Just with the public, uh, can you get behind in the actual template to see how the author did that? Absolutely. So all we need to do is go here and click download, up, and you can click download the tablet workbook. And you can play with it yourself. And then reverse engineer how they got the angle. It's a great way to learn Tableau. Another question. Is there is a speed overhead when it comes to Tableau public in comparison to Tableau desktop? Yes. There is. Uh, network delay, Tableau public is free. Sometimes it's more responsive than other times. Uh, Tableau sells something called Tableau Server where you can create your own version of Tableau That's public. Like 10K. You know, um, you're limited to 10 million rows in Tableau Public. Um, you know that that could be a consideration. Uh, there's there's a lot of depth in Tableau that we're not talking about. Mm -hmm. You could take a data set and you could aggregate it based on measures. So each one of those flights is a single ent single row. I could say rather than that, let's aggregate it by hour. Or let's aggregate it by day and get very similar results to what I was showing with a much smaller data set. Uh, Art of the Possible. This was done by someone named Adam McCann. He's a Deloitte consultant based in DC. Who I, I just love some of the stuff he did. Uh, this is a little bit more lighthearted and it's looking at the Beatles. So the height of the note shows the ranking of the song. This is for who wrote songs that ended up on the Billboard 100. So the higher the note, the, the higher ranking of the song, then this is called a Senki chart, and it's going to show who wrote each of the songs. And then there's some interesting sentiment analysis that's being done here. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, showing what could be done by artists. Uh, back to PowerPoint. So, where to go from here? If if this if this is of interest to you all, um, this is I think the single most important book for modern visual theory, and it's fairly recent. It's a gentleman named Stephen Pugh. Tufty is wonderful, but Tufty is. Um, I would say uh, Tufty gets to be kind of academic. Uh, Stephen mm -hmm. Pugh is really written for the practitioner. It's also a little dated. I mean, Napoleon's March, you know, who needs something to argue? Yeah. yeah, well, but not just Napoleon's March. Right. Uh, what was available in terms of visual display of quantitative information in the late 1980s and early exactly. 1990s when Tufty pioneered in that area has advanced? Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. And I don't think Tufty's written a new book. Uh, he's got four total. Yeah. Um, so the most recent one was maybe eight years ago. Longer than that, I think. Okay. Um, 
this is a practitioner book. Uh, it says for business, but it gives you a lot of different examples on how to display different types of information that would be germane to the academic world. Um, something that both Tufty and Cole Nussbaumer Nafik agree on is that pie charts are a horrible way of presenting information. Is it anybody you like pie charts here? Okay. <laughs> Uh, on Tableau itself, uh, there's about 70 different learning videos. Uh, it's very easy to, to follow this. Lynda.com, which we have a free subscription to here at George Mason, has two or three uh, Tableau courses. I would recommend starting with the Tableau Tableau videos just because they're more up to date. They're kept current as Tableau versions change. Um, when you get into this or when you download your academic license you'll be sent an email that actually gives you a learning plan and it says start with this video then go to this video then this video tableau offers free uh, webinars uh, where you can do a class so you have an instructor and you're sitting there as a class participant able mute isn't on you're able to interact with the instructor there's usually two or three of these a week as well as webinars on other advanced courses in a variety of different languages. There's something called the Tableau Viz of the Day. This is a very passive thing. You sign up for it and every day Tableau will send you a visualization of the day. Um, and some of them are remarkably innovative and interesting. Uh, if you have a really good Viz, you get to become Viz of the Week and that's displayed on the Tableau start page and this is this week's Viz of the Week that's looking at um, calorie consumption <clears throat> per country. You know, the more the lines go to the 0 0.5, the more it comes to the average across the world. If I wanted to look at just protein consumption, I'd be able to filter out the other lines. And it's kind of in line with, with some of the, the, the nature of some of the things that you all look at. Um, finally, uh, if you want to really become good in Tableau, uh, there's something called Makeover Monday. Every Monday, a different data set is released. About 70 different people will, will create visualizations based on that data set, and people share it. So there's a very, very vibrant community uh, around Tableau. So with that, this is my email. Um, I'm happy, if you have an interesting problem, I'm happy to work with you all because I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm retired. Um, I'm very interested in understanding how we can stretch academic discourse to include the extra capabilities that visualization would allow particularly interested in how we might be able to do that with online resources and maybe the interplay of online resources with traditional journal articles. And my, uh, well, first let me ask, are, are there any questions? Might you be interested in looking into political targeting? I don't know. <laughs> If if you have if you have interesting data you want to visualize it, it's worth it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I have a personal request. I am faced with an econometric uh, covariance model that I don't understand, or I think I understand. Is there anyone who wants to spend a second or two looking at this model with me yeah, and, and helping me understand it? Okay. Thank well, you very much. Thank you all. Can you go back to the signal reference? Yes, sir. I, I can fast. send this out as a, as a link to you all. Yes. Yeah. Are we getting the slides? Or? Uh, I'll send it to Karen and. Yeah. We'll yeah. make it available. Okay. okay. One Thank last, you. One last thing. Geospatial analytics is this. Oh, yeah. Available in Tableau? In what sense? Well,. I had a problem recently of studying gentrification in BC. Can Tableau any how help be the visual tool for this? So, you know, in in Tableau itself, 
Um, what Tableau is going to ship with is uh, ability to geocode. Got a couple different map layers.